welcome everyone who is watching. Uh, my name is James Meter. I'm from the Knopf Doubleday Publishing Group. Uh, we are here this evening to celebrate uh, nearing the end of Latinx Heritage Month and the 20th anniversary of Ernesto Quinones' uh, landmark novel, Bodega Dreams. Um, I'm only going to introduce our moderator, Rosie Cordero from Entertainment Weekly, who we are very, very uh, lucky to have with us this evening. I'm going to turn this over to Rosie, who will introduce uh, Juan and Ernesto, and you will not all see me again for about 40 minutes. So you have a great conversation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, James. Hi, everybody. My name is Rosie, and uh, it's a pleasure for me tonight to introduce our beloved Ernesto Quinones. We are very proud to call him ours. Uh, the author of Bodega Dreams, which just celebrated its 20th year. Ernesto is also an associate professor at Cornell University, where he teaches creative writing, Latino fiction, and magical realism, among other topics. Welcome, Ernesto. Thanks for having me, and thanks, Juan, for doing this. Uh, it's an honor. Also with us, we have Juan Gonzalez, the nationally known journalist, social activist, and public intellectual. He was raised in East Harlem and Brooklyn, and he currently serves as professor of communications and public policy at Rutgers University. Also super proud to call you ours. Welcome. Hi, Rosie and Ernesto, and my pleasure to be here. Well, when I was first invited to moderate this panel, and they told me it was called, um, like who, and I wonder who has not read Bodega Dreams? I mean, everybody has, it should be mandatory reading everywhere. Um, Juan, do you remember when is the first time you read Bodega Dreams? Yeah, I read it when it first came out. I met Ernesto back then and uh, I, I didn't know him before and, uh, and I jumped into the book and it was sort of a trip through memory lane for me because so many of the, the places that he mentions uh, in the book and so many of the situations uh, were those that, uh, uh, that I was familiar with, whether it was Schomburg Plaza or Taino Towers or the, or the Museo or the, even the Gonzalez Funeral Home we got in and the Puerto de Burgo School. These were all uh, landmarks and uh, in my own development and my own uh, uh, upbringing and of course in my own experience with the young lords and so it was clear that it, this was an authentic novel of somebody who knew east harlem uh inside out from the very beginning from the first pages even the names so many of the names of the characters not just their regular names but the nicknames uh were so familiar to me that it really was sort of a uh, a homecoming in terms of a book for me and for me, as somebody who didn't grow up in the area at all and got to know it as an adult, the, his colorful words really transported me to this place, this, this awesome place of Spanish Harlem that's so full of music and sketchy, fun characters. I, I'm like, I wish I would have grown up there and been able to experience that. Um, but that's the magic of Ernesto's writing. Uh, Ernesto, can you take us back all these years to uh, where the idea first came from for you for Bodega Dreams? Well, you know, I'm so happy um, that Juan liked it because um, I think the reason why Bodega Dreams is the success that it is, is because of the Young Lords, because of the introduction of the Young Lords. And a lot of people have forgotten about them. Everyone remembers the Panthers. Um, everyone remembers, um, you know, the March on Washington. And some people actually even remember the Weathermen, but they don't remember the Young Lords. And they, they did amazing stuff. And I wanted to introduce my neighborhood and its mythology, its, its, its history, its mythological uh, beings too, which is what they became to us, to, to, to the new generation. We saw the young lords, not just as you know, people, but as, as larger than life characters, you know? So Juan Gonzalez, Felipe Luciano, you know, Yoruba, you know, Denise Oliver, when I met her, I asked her the same question I remember asking Juan when I met him you know, um, why did the Young Lords broke up? And I remember one saying, we all thought we were it. And it, Denise Oliver basically sort of said the same thing, you know? So I wanted to introduce all of this stuff to, to all of this beauty that Spanish Harlem has to the public. 
because when uh, you think about East Harlem, you think of Harlem, and yes, Harlem has Harlem kicks our ass. They produce all this amazing history, jazz, and all these amazing writers. And but you know, East Harlem hasn't done that bad either. You know, we have some wonderful stuff, and that's the reason why I wanted to write it. Okay, so um, can you kind of talk a little bit about your journey of getting it sold? You were a first-time author. Can you talk a little bit about that? Okay, yes, I was a first time author. And like most first time authors, you know, I had a, I had a rough time getting published. Everyone was rejecting it. And uh, I was like, you know, it's all right, you know, maybe a, a small press or something. And then uh, Robin Desser here at, at Kanaf, she was very nice enough to actually pick it up. And she said, you know what? Um, sure, this sounds good, sounds authentic, sounds organic. Um, but they gave it straight to paperback, okay, no hardcover straight to paperback and um, you know, they kicked a few cents my way and I was like, that's, that's all I want is for whiskey, man. So I was good. <laughs> Juan, as, as, as we continue the conversations about um, Latinos in publishing, how do you think uh, Bodega Dreams added uh, to that conversation and continues to add? Well, I think it was, it's critical. It's, it's sort of, it, it was, uh, the generational sequence to, let's say, uh, Perry Thomas's Down These Mean Streets in terms of uh, dealing with the uh, Puerto Rican and Latino community of East Harlem as an area for our artistic, in-depth artistic uh, expression. I mean, uh, delving deep into the not only personal psyches of normal human interactions, but the social context in which they occur. And I think that was, uh, that was critical. And, and I think, you know, I, I've been surprised over the years because, you know, The Young Lord was more than 50 years ago now. And uh, the, um, the enormous impact that, it's, uh, that uh, our group had s still on the consciousness, not only of our generation, but in generations uh, that came afterwards. I, I remember a few years ago, I did a, a public conversation uh, with uh, Sonia Manzano from uh, who played oh, Sesame, Sesame Street. Sesame Street for uh, 40 years, uh, and with uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda, just before, just as Hamilton was coming out, we did a big uh, public conversation at NYU, and, and uh, Sonia wrote a, a book more geared to young people, The Revolution of Evelyn Serrano, which is also based on the young lords and, the, and, the, and, the, uh, uh, and what happened at People's Church, and she said that that had a big impact on her life, and uh, there were many folks who sort of, uh, had their cultural awakening, their artistic awakening, uh, as a result of the political ferment and the and the uh, activism uh, that we demonstrated when we were in our 20s. So I think in that sense, th this is, uh, Ernesto's novel is probably the most full-throated look at what happened and, and also what happened afterwards, because obviously Willy Bodega uh, is an ex, <laughs> an ex-young lord, uh, uh, as is, uh, uh, as is Veronica, the, the, uh, his, the love of his life, and, but yet they changed. They went, their, their lives moved on, and yet they were still holding that uh, in, to those ideals, to, that, to those uh, beliefs, at least Willy Bodega was in, in um, Ernesto's novels. So I think that the impact of the political revolution that we were involved in also had an enormous effect on cultural awareness, and people forget the People's Church was um, Eddie Palmieri's church. That was the church where Eddie Palmieri uh, uh, worshipped. You know, the People's Church was Pedro Pietri's church. Uh, that's where Pedro's whole family developed. And in fact, when we took over the church, uh, the great poet Pedro Pietri was in direct conflict because he was part of, the, uh, part, part of the occupation while the rest of his family were parishioners who were opposed to the occupation. So it's, it really was the center of a whole political, cultural uh, revolution that occurred and that has continued over the generations. Mm -hmm. Ernesto, um, since we are uh, having view of some viewers that who have never read the book yet, uh, can you please just uh, introduce it? Tell us a little bit about it and the main characters. Well, it's basically um, uh, narrated by a young, a young man who is very much influenced by the idealism of the young lords, as Juan said. And I think that one of the reasons why the book appeals to young people to this day, after 20 years, which I'm totally not just flattered, but also like 
uh, amazed and happy, but totally amazed is because it's so full of, of the romance in the book is how you try to help your fellow man, your fellow woman, your fellow people in the social justice, um, you know, um, um, vein. And it, 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 today's with Black Lives Matter and you can see how young people have really grabbed onto that. There's, some, there's, there's a big romance uh, appeal in bringing social change. And in Bodega Dreams, that's what I try to, you know, uh, go after. And I, I feel that um, the, the young people of today seem to um, uh, really resonate with that. So Chino, you know, he's, he's a bit skeptical. He has a wife. They're very young. They're like 19. And the reason also they're like very young is because the young lords were very young. They were anywhere between 17, 16 to like 22, 23. They were not older than that. And, and um, so in my, my characters, Chino is like 19, Blanca's like 19. And you know, they're trying to, they're married, they have a, Blanca's pregnant and they're trying to like work their way to a better uh, status and um, economic status. And here comes uh, Chino's uh, childhood friend, Sapo, who knows a guy named Willie Bodega who's doing good and at the same time also doing very uh, questionable things. What he's doing is he's taking all these uh, buildings that the city of New York has pretty much left to rot and has not fixed up and he's buying them from the city and he is renovating them and putting um, Puerto Ricans or people from East Harlem to live there and also to um, go to school. He's paying their tuition of their children so they can become professionals and stay in the neighborhood and rise up the neighborhood and Spanish Harlem will have its own middle or even wealthy class and that's his dream. And when Chino first he meets Willy Bodega, he's not really into him. He thinks that he's just a big, you know, loud mouth. And then uh, Sapo tells him, now, nah, man, that guy was once one of the young lords. And that sort of makes Chino say, oh, uh, I, maybe I should check this, this guy out. And that's basically the, the novel. And um, uh, this full of all these characters that I used to know in, around the neighborhood. People like Sapo, you know, Sapo was a real person, but he died when he was like 14. He was like the kid that was really bad, you know, but he was my friend, you know, he, he meant adventure. So I, I never listened to my mom when she would say, no, quiero verte con Sapo, es el niño malo. And I would still, you know, um, hang out with him. And you see that in Bodega Dreams through Blanca. Blanca says, I don't want to see around Sapo, um, telling her husband, because Sapo's a drug dealer and he can, you know, bring some harm to Chino. So um, that's what basically I was trying to capture. And that's basically the story, sort of. Juan, um, having been that you grew up in this neighborhood and you grew up around the Willy Bodegas uh, of the area, what do you think you would think of uh, El Barrio today? <laughs> well, obviously, El Barrio has changed uh, uh, dramatically. I mean, number, uh, number one, even the Latino community has changed dramatically, whereas it used to be largely Puerto Rican. Uh, today, it is largely Mexican and Central American in terms of, of uh, population. And there's still some Puerto Ricans left in the projects, but for the most part, uh, there's been a tremendous change, even in the Latino community. And then of course, gentrification has taken over so much of East Harlem. Uh, the, the old Italian area that uh, Ernesto talks about over on uh, First Avenue, Second Avenue, that's all changed. Uh, everything below 110th Street pretty much now. Uh, uh, has been gentrified. That's not public housing. Uh, and I, I think the only reason why East Harlem has not been totally gentrified is because there was so much public housing and the city could never actually get the uh, support, public support to just tear down the projects like they did in Chicago and other places. And so the existence of public housing has meant that a certain percentage of the community remains low income and therefore the whole community cannot be completely gentrified because if it wasn't for the if it wasn't for the projects uh, the uh, the whole the whole neighborhood would have been totally gentrified by now uh, so I think that there's been a huge change but there's still a cultural core to uh, to the community because of the institutions that were created whether it's El Museo, and we all know El Museo has its problems <laughs> in terms of the battles internally, uh, whether it's El, 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 El Tayel, whether it's um, uh, the, uh, the various theater groups that still exist uh, that are functioning out of East Harlem, uh, 
whether it's the 116th Street strip uh, that remains a, a commercial strip, uh, that uh, uh, all these things hold the, the, the cultural life together uh, of the neighborhood, regardless of the changes on the fringes. Ernesto, since uh, the release of this book 20 years ago, you've become kind of a, a superstar around El Barrio. Uh, and I kind of imagine you as a, as a Willy Bodega of sorts in that uh, you have inspired a lot of young people. Can you kind of talk about uh, uh, the way that you are received in the area by, by the people? Um, you know what? I think that's absolutely wonderful. And, you know, I'm so happy that the book is... Um, you know, embraced, um, you know, uh, I'll tell you the story, but it wasn't in El Barrio, it actually happened in Los Aida, which also has projects, um, not as many as, El, 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 but it, it was in the projects. And I was walking by Los Aida, somewhere by, I don't know, Second Avenue and like Third, anyway, somewhere around there. And this woman kept, kept um, following me. And finally, I, you know, I knew she wasn't gonna mug me or anything, but smile, I turned around and I said, you know, senor, <laughs> Get it. Get it. And she said, oh, you know, we live in the projects and my two sons don't want to go to high school and the only book they read is Bodega Dreams. Can you come and tell them they got to go back to high school? And I said, you know what? Sounds good, right? So I, I, I went to the, the, the Loi side, the, the projects by the Loi side. And, you know, I went and I, I, I opened, you know, I went with the lady and the kids were watching Pulp Fiction, I remember. And I was like, yo, you know, um, you know I, I know Trent, you know, I was at Sundance, you know, and they were like, oh my God, you know, can you sign our books? And I said, listen, if you guys finish your high school, I will go to your graduation, all right? So go back to school and when you graduate, send me an email and I will be there and you can take pictures and tell your friends that you know the guy who wrote that book. And they were like, okay, can you bring Tarantino? I said, no, I don't know him that well. I just met him, I just met him at Sundance, okay? And they were like, all right. And then they, and they graduated like a year and a half later. They actually graduated. They were these kind of heavy guys, you know, little chubby guys. And I was right there. And I felt like Alice in Wonderland with Tweedledee and Tweedledum. And I was like, you know, this is what it's all about. You know, Gemma, you know, I would love awards, but these are my awards. And I, I, I was just so happy. And that was due to the book. Juan, can anybody tell you that there's no power in a book? That's power. <laughs> Well, I, I think it's, he's being modest. I think he's had a bigger impact than just a, a few people. I think it's- Oh, I know he uh, has. It's, uh, it's uh, we have to really grasp that when a young person is awakened by a book, it lasts really for most of their lives. And I think that, uh, that his uh, contribution through this book in terms of connecting, because the thing is to connect with the young people and a book connects uh, with uh, the, the uh, with alienated youth, because it's such the language is so real, the characters are so real, and I think that that's the most. Of, I mean, for folks who are not not of the community or not knowledgeable of the community, it's it's fascinating, but it doesn't have the I think the uh, the emotional impact that it does on pe on young people who come out of the of, of similar situations, whether it's South Central or uh, or, uh, or whether it's a uh, East LA, or whether it's South Side of Chicago, and that, uh, or, or North Philly, that these folks who come from neighborhoods like this that never get the literary attention, <laughs> other than in completely negative fashion. Because I mean, he he does deal in the book with all the negative aspects of life uh, in uh, in a low income and poor community, but you at the same time see people striving, even the criminals, <laughs> striving to make something meaningful out of their lives, which I think is important. Ernesto, I'm not sure how many people know this, but uh, there's this actor named Luis Guzman and he is making a movie based on Bodega Dreams. What can you tell us about that? Oh, you know, Luis is awesome. I like the guy, you know, he's from Los Aida, you know, but um, I, he really understands the story, was really into it. You know, he's actually from that era, you know, um, I'm sure Juan knows him. He's like, makes sure that he knows all of, you know, what he calls his, his celebratory Puerto Ricans, you know, so he like goes out of his way to meet everybody. So he's very embracing, you know, the thing, uh, Luis, Luis, I, I trust with my heart and soul. It's Hollywood, you know, so until, 
until you don't see a movie up there on the screen, you don't believe it. <laughs> that's that's just Hollywood. So I know well, Luis. Yeah. He was out there shooting it. Well, you know, um, it doesn't mean that it'll be released. You know, I mean, it's there's just so much in a movie that it takes so many green lights, not just the green light where everyone says, oh, it's been green lighted. That doesn't mean it's going to be released. Doesn't mean. So, you know, until I see it up there, it's been 20 years. Listen, everyone's premise promised me a movie. Benicio, Freddy Rodriguez, Fox Searchlights, you know, all of these and never happened. So, you know, until I see the movie, I'll say, oh, cool. Now I'll believe it. And, I'll, you know, so, but Luis is awesome, you know, and I wish him the best of luck and he has all my support. But you were, were you involved in the, uh, in the story? Um, yeah, I was involved in the story. Yeah, but it's writing the screenplay. Okay, so it's going to be very authentic. This is going to come out. I'm going to prende todas las velitas, you know? I hope so. That would uh, be great. Juan, are we going to see you uh, on the big screen playing uh, playing a significant role? You definitely belong there. Well, you know, there's been all kinds of attempts over the years to do stuff, uh, to do films on the Young Lords, and, and uh, it's, it's, uh, a, a, not a lot of them were as authentic in the way that uh, Ernesto's book is. And, and I think they deservedly uh, died before being made. And uh, I think that uh, there was all, you know, Carmelo Anthony has, has long wanted to do a, 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 a film on the Lords because his father was in the, in the Young Lords. And uh, there have been efforts um, uh, by um, John Leguizamo and others, but uh, but they've all had problems, and so I don't think it's happened yet. Maybe it will, and and uh, I'm not. I'm more interested. I've you know gone more into nonfiction, and uh, there was a big uh, a, a big uh, documentary film uh, made on my uh, on my book on Latinos, uh, Harvest of Empire, which was very, actually very successful. Uh, but uh, I think eventually, the, the the myth will have to be put on. On screen, uh, the of uh, the uh, the mythic nature of the Lords will have to be put on screen. But it's it's the filmmakers haven't shown up yet who will win the confidence of enough of the former Lords to get our participation. Because uh, several of us have turned down, refused to be involved in projects that we thought were not were not true to the the, the spirit and the and the principles of the Lords. So there's lots of attempts to exploit anything that has certain popularity. The issue is, uh, what what legacy does a, a film leave in people's minds of what the Lords were about? Ernesto, uh, one of the readers wants to know how did writing Taina compare to writing Bodega? Oh, um, Taina was completely a, a different uh, process in the sense that I had to do a little bit of research. I mean, I had grown up uh, Jehovah's Witness. So I remember the church and there was a lot of churches have a lot of gossip, but when it came to the sterilization of women, when women would actually would sterilize themselves because they, they would lose their jobs um, if the boss found out that they were pregnant or they felt like this was better for, the, for their health because they already had two kids or whatever. And there was no laws. So a lot of women would actually would, would sterilize themselves and actually also the doctors would encourage this they would coerce this. They would say, you know, well, it's better if, you know, you're in America now, you, you have two kids, you want me to, you know, not just, they would say tie your twos, but that's a lie. They were actually like really sterilized them. And in Puerto Rico, it was really rampant and uh, in the 60s, 70s, all the way up to the 80s and who knows what's happening now. So I had to do a little bit more research um, when it came to that, to, to Taina. Um, and I used some examples that I remember that I have been a witness to in my, in my, um, uh, religious uh, upbringing. But the thing about Bodega Dreams, there was very little research because all of that is stuff that I knew very well and stuff that I loved. You know, El Barrio, The Young Lords, my friends. Um, the book is also about friendship and basically everyone there that that I, you know, that I talk about was my friend, like you know, Googie Vato. Googie Vato was like one of the few Mexicans at that time. And we used to call him Googie. His name was Googie, but we used to call him Vato because that place, Zoot Suit, was out. And there was a commercial with a guy saying it, it's, it's the fantasy of every vato to wear the suit suit and play the myth of the pachuco, right? And so we used to call him uh, Googie Vato and he was kind of fat. So we used to say Googie Vato, you know, he ate his cat and then all his tacos. 
he would say, I don't got a cat. And he said, because you ate him. <laughs> so all of this happy stuff that I remember, I, I didn't have to look anywhere. And um, so there were times when it made me very happy. And then writing Taina, there were times when I would get very sad because it's a very sad and hurtful story of the sterilization of Puerto Rican women. Um, it's, it's really a, a, a big tragedy. Another question from a viewer, what's one message, lesson, or theme that you hope readers take away uh, from reading Bodega Dreams? Um, you know, uh, it's whatever you uh, find that can help you in Bodega Dreams. I, 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 I told a story that I wanted to tell, and now the book does no longer belong to me. The characters no longer belong to me. Um, it belongs to you. And whatever you find in this book that can help you, can make you laugh that can make you that inspires you whatever then i'm i'm so happy and um you know good luck good luck to you and thank you thank you for supporting me and thank you for reading my story so there'll never be a sequel no there's no sequel it's gonna be you know, listen you've got one story you you don't need a second coming you already got one coming you don't need a second coming all right i mean be nice to others as you are to yourself. All of that stuff. We don't need a second coming. We got it. And I'm sure that if there's a sequel, if I write a sequel, it won't be as good. And for a while, I thought maybe I should do a sequel with the women, with the girls, with Blanca and Negra, and you know, maybe talk about the, the female um, leadership in the Young Lords, bring in Denise Oliver, you know, and, 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 and some of the others. And I, but then I said, you know what? It's just going to suck. Just, just quit while you're behind. <laughs> well, if anybody wants to know uh, where the characters would be in present in present time, they can go to EW.com and see my interview with Ernesto, where I grilled him to find out where all the characters would be today. So we can't give that one away. But um, Juan, a question for you. Um, do you think that with everything that's going on in 2020, that there are any themes or just the story in general takes on a new meaning? Well, I think every generation of young people has to make its own history. And the most, the most uh, conscious ones find a way. Uh, you know, when I was reporting at with the New York Daily News for many years, I started being contacted, I guess, guess this was around the early 2000s, by a young guy by the name of Juan Jaro, who uh, heads an organization in East Harlem called the Movement for Justice in El Bajio. Uh, and he was such a fiery organizer and, and he was basically working with the Mexican immigrant community, uh, un the undocumented community that were being exploited by landlords who felt they could, they could, they could gouge them any way they, they wanted to because the tenants would be afraid to challenge them in court because they were undocumented. So his whole work was among the undocumented of East Harlem and yet he was he was uh, managing to bring out scores of people, hundreds of people in protest against major uh, investment firms that were buying up the tenements of East Harlem to gentrify them. Uh, and I said to myself, damn, this is like a, a new version of the Young Lords now. And this is now we're talking in the early 2000s, that was 40 years later. Uh, so, uh, so you see that every, and of course now we have an entire new generation of the dreamers and and the Black Lives Matter folks. So every, every new generation has its activists uh, who look beyond the pettiness of their everyday lives and the problems of the everyday lives and think big and seek to make major change. So I think that that's, that to me is what's always inspiring, watching young people believe they can conquer the world. And sometimes mm -hmm. they accomplish quite a bit, <laughs> but they eventually find it's a lot harder to conquer the world uh, than they thought. Hey, Rosie, can I ask Juan a question? Of course, please. Okay. Hey, Juan, when, you, when the Daily News was on strike, like in the late, 80, late 80s, early 90s, 89, around there, I think, 88, around there, um, and you, you, took, you took control of the strike of the, to be the spokesperson for the Daily News strike workers, what gave you the idea to have the homeless deliver the, the newspaper? Because I remember there was all these homeless, and they would sell the paper. Uh, I think it was like 35 cents back then. No, what, what no, gave actually, we, were, we were on strike. I'll tell you exactly what it was because it's, you know, it's, it's, in, it's forever uh, branded in my, uh, uh, in my mind is uh, uh, we were on strike for five months from um, 
from October 25th, 1990 until March of 1991. It was mm -hmm. one of the longest strikes uh, in newspaper history and the last victorious strike uh, mm -hmm. anywhere in the, in the, in the, in the country and uh, against the Tribune Company, which owned the Daily News at that time and which owns it now, even though it's now changed its name. And, um, and it wasn't us who had the homeless sell the paper, it was the company. Uh, because uh -huh. the company, once they forced us all out, and there was 2,500 of us that were on strike, about six or 700 in, among the reporters, but then there were the printers, the, 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 the pressmen, the, the drivers, the advertising people. So 2,500 in, in total, we were all fired one day by the company. And, the, and uh, so they, tr they hired the homeless to sell the paper, the, the scab paper in the street, the, yeah. the paper they were producing uh, uh, while the strike was going on. And uh, so what we did is we started our own newspaper, uh, the strike newspaper called The Real News. And we were then, it was a competition. We were, and the reason the company chose the homeless is because a few of the unions within the Daily News, Pressmen especially, had always been very racist and exclusionary to people of color. And, they, and the company was hoping to win the support of the black and Latino leaders to break the strike. And uh, so I had to somehow deal with the fact that there were some racist unions among our 10 unions, but everyone was being screwed over by the company. And so we had to somehow you know, go after the pressmen for their historic racism, but at the same time, keep all the workers together to win the strike. And we eventually did win the strike and we forced Tribune to sell the paper uh, and, uh, and to give us back our job. But it was a long, bitter winter. Five, in fact, I always joke that the Gulf War started and began. We were on strike before the Gulf War started, and we were still on strike after the Gulf War ended. <laughs> right? So our strike lasted longer than the Gulf War against Saddam Hussein. Uh, but we managed to come wow. out victorious. And the lessons I learned through the Young Lords about how to organize people helped me a lot in being able to help lead that strike. Thank you. Juan, do you have anything that you want to ask Ernesto? I've been hogging up all the time, all the questions. Yeah, I, I, I uh, the interesting thing to me is um, uh, I wasn't quite clear in the book. Was Edwin Nazario, the lawyer, the bad guy? who turned? Who, it's, a, it's a great surprise at the end, the, the, whole, the whole ending of the book. But was Nazario part of that history with Willie Bodega and uh, with Veronica, or did, or did he come later? You know, Nazario is sort of also modeled after Jerry Rivers, after yeah. Geraldo, after because Geraldo. he was the lawyer who wasn't exactly with the law, uh, with the Lords, but he sort of, but the, and they didn't exactly like him either, because they knew he was more of a media whore than actually idealist which he is today, he's more of a media whore than an idealist. Um, and so he's sort of, so even though he had something to do with the Lords and he's from that time, you, you don't exactly trust him. So that's why I sort of modeled um, Nazario. And of course, we find out later that it was actually him and Vera were always, um, yeah. you know, yeah, well, together. I know, Geraldo well. I know Geraldo well, all of, all of the pluses and the minuses. <laughs> okay, <many> yes, <laughs> exactly, yes, yes. Ernesto, we have a really good uh, question from uh, one of the viewers. They want to know whether Sapo's biting tendencies were inspired by real events. The, the, what, no, Sapo didn't really bite. Um, what, I, what happened with Sapo was that um, he, um, he used to carry some, sometimes he used to bring his 007, which is a knife. Um, and uh, uh, that teacher, Mr. Blessington, was actually a real teacher. So when we were taking an exam, it was history, not English. He wasn't an English teacher, it was history. So we're taking an exam and he said, I don't wanna see anyone cheating. And right away, of course, you say that, Sapo's gonna you know, start cheating, right? So he, he went over to Sapo and said, you're cheating. And he took his paper and he just like you know, crushed it. So then he said, now you have zero. So, so then Sapo took out another paper, right? And then Blessington came back and said, you're not going to draw in my class right now. And no one's doing their work now. Everybody, anyway, this is going to be good, man. This is going to be good. We're just waiting, right? So no one's doing a test. No one's. And then when he took out the third paper, 
right? When Blessing was going to grab that one, he was ready for him. And the thing was that Blessington, just like in the book, he will always come dressed in a suit. He was like this very, very high and mighty, here I come to save the day liberal, because he was doing us a favor, he always would say. Instead of being at, at Wall Street, making a ton of money, he would say, I'm here teaching you kids. So he would always come with a suit. So he had a, he had a tie. So when he, when he went to grab his um, Sapo's paper, Sapo took the tie and he took out his 007 and cut it. <laughs> That's what happened. And he took the tie and he put his mouth, he was going, uh, like it was a tongue. And that's what happened. But, you know, for fiction's sake, I, I mentioned that at the beginning that Sapo, you know, bites. So then instead of when I, when I brought that event from my life, I sort of changed it and made it fit the, the, how I had set it up that he bites, so he had to bite Blessington. Well, but that kind never... of fit in with the whole, he's a frog, you know? He looks like a frog. Well, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, somebody else wants to know if you've been writing anything new during quarantine. Oh, I'm writing a mystery novel, just a mystery novel. Um, you know, uh, Juan mentioned The Undocumented and it has to do with The Undocumented. It's basically about a, a guy who, um, he gets bribed by the police because he did something. And what's happening is that um, a crime has been committed and it has to do within the undocumented com community and the undocumented community will not talk to the police, but they will talk to him. So they, they bribe him. You gotta find that murderer because they're not talking to us. And if you don't do it, well, then you're gonna go to prison because of what you did. So it's sort of basically um, a mystery and he goes into the undocumented community and he um, tries to you know, figure out what's happening and they have, they have his trust because he actually does favors for, for them because they're afraid to go to the police. And, um, you know, they don't speak English very well, most of them. And he speaks amazing Spanish. And he's um, is uh, always um, uh, getting mad with his cousin because his cousin's Puerto Rican, but doesn't speak any Spanish. And there you have, you know, the old, the old um, uh, uh, um, you know, debate. And I basically model my, my novels over my own political issues and my own political beliefs and my own culture and our tics, both good and bad. And, you know, so it, um, we'll see. That's basically it. When can, re when can we read that one before the pandemic's over? Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm seeing, I'm, uh, I don't know. You know, I'm hoping to give it in to Cristobal this, this, this at the end of the month, but who knows? Juan, what are you, oh, sorry, no, did somebody talk? Oh, no, go ahead, sorry. No, it's fine. Juan, uh, what, ha what, have you found any really good books that you read during this pandemic that you can recommend? Yeah, uh, well, I've been, um, I've been sort of immersed in uh, in studies more than anything because I'm I'm doing a sort of a, a a third edition of my of my Harvest of Empire that's also due very soon and uh, so oh I'm nice more, more involved in uh, academic studies sort sort of trying to get the the latest stuff that's come out in terms of various aspects of the Latino community whether it's immigration um, politics uh, language and culture and and, uh, and also Puerto Rico, there's so much that's happened since the last edition of Harvest, which was back in 2011, just in terms of Puerto Rico. I mean, uh, and uh, whether it's the, the debt crisis or uh, Hurricane Maria or the, uh, uh, or the, um, the, governor. the imposition of the control board. And then of course, uh, last summer, the overthrow of the governor, forcing the governor Ricky Rosselló out. Uh, that's all that's happened in the last four or five years. So there's been huge changes uh, in not only that Latino community and immigration, but in Puerto Rico as well and in politics. So, but I can't finish the book until we see the results of the election in a few weeks, because <laughs> that's that could have a big impact on a lot of things. So I'm waiting. I'm, I'm trying to tell my publisher, wait until a month after the election, and who knows how long it'll take to, to figure out the we, result of the election. Uh, that's right. Before I, I deliver. The we book. need that book to have a happy ending. Hopefully. Hopefully, or a happier ending. Yeah. Juan, I'll stay with you. Um, do you have any advice for any uh, first time writers looking to get published? Yeah, um, you know, 
writing is tough, but editing your writing is really where, where uh, is the key. I mean, it's not just that you write, but that you have to constantly rewrite and, uh, uh, and, uh, and chisel. It, you know, the, when you first start writing, it's just uh, formless until you actually get down to rewriting and editing and editing again and editing again. Uh, you really don't have a finished product. So the thing is, uh, and that's those problems that he had in terms of initially getting published are sim very similar to the problems that I had in doing Harvest of Empire. I, I must have gone through, I don't know how many publishers. And, and even after I had a contract, uh, I ended up disagreeing with my editors several places and left several publishers. And, and yet here we are, because I think Harvest of Empire came out as a nonfiction history around the same time of Bodega Dreams, and it's still selling tremendously well on colleges, campuses. And, uh, but I had to have the faith, take the eight years that it took me going through all of these rejections. And uh, before, uh, if you don't have faith in your work, you're never going to get through the hard times. You have to have faith in your work, and then you have to do the hard work of constantly writing and rewriting uh, before you get the kind of product you can be proud of. That's great advice. Anything you can add to that, Nesto, from your experience? No, just keep at it. And as one said, keep at it, and you will get rejected. It's like love. It's going to clobber you. It doesn't matter who you are. It's going to clobber you, but you just got to keep going and keep going and keep going. And eventually, somebody will marry you. Somebody will say, this is amazing. I will publish you. And then that's not the end. As one said, you know, you, you might need changes that they, that, that they want, but you don't want and other stuff, you know. Coming back to the Young Lords though, if you're interested in the Young Lords, you know, you can also see this wonderful documentary by Iris Morales uh, called Palante Siempre Palante. Wonderful documentary. I show it to my students Every semester I show it to my students and the students are actually Latino, Puerto Ricans or other Latin, never heard of the Young Lords and they feel so happy to know. And some of them actually go and get their own information online, which now you can do so easily. And I think that that is amazing. And that is, it makes me feel like a real teacher that I exposed them to something that they actually want more of on their own. And I'm like, okay, you're, you're on the right track. And it's, it's a wonderful documentary by Iris Morales, who was a Young Lord. Uh, Palante, Siempre Palante. Of course, one is there and everyone's there and tells a wonderful story. Wanda, viewers want to know more about your book. Let's go back to talking more about your book. What, Harvest of Empire? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's like I said, it's been out, it was originally came out in 2001 and then it was second edition in 2011. So now I'm working on third edition. But it's, uh, it, it just, it sort of, it looks at the whole, development, the growth of the Latino community in the United States. Because understand, uh, I was born in Puerto Rico, but I came here when I, when I was just two months old. So I basically lived in the United States my entire life, and I'm now 73. <laughs> so uh, so uh, my, ex my experience has been the, the, I've seen the growth of the Latino community in the United States. Uh, from the 1950s when I was a kid uh, till now. Uh, and it's an astonishing change what has happened in America. Uh, and when you think that back in 1970, there were only 9 million Latinos in the United States. Uh, uh, today, there are more than 60 million. Uh, and, uh, and this is just in a 50 year period. The explosion of the, of the population, the diversity of the population, uh, the spread of the population. There is no small, no small town in America today where you do not find significant numbers of Latinos. Uh, and uh, so it's really transformed the, the country. And I try to, in Harvest of Empire, look at why did people come? Where did they go to? How did they build their communities? What was happening in their countries that made them come here? Uh, and sort of, I, I sort of take a, uh, a, a look at the actual organic growth of the communities around the country. Uh, and, um, and it turned out to be a very, very popular book. It's, you know, uh, 200 colleges use it as, as a required text. So it's, uh, it's, it's managed to, to find its place. And given the fact that there's so many more Latinos in college, <laughs> you know, 50% of the student body of Cal State University, uh, of the Cal State University system, 
uh, is Latino today. Not, and, uh, uh, and this is happening across the, the United States. So, um, you know, I think that, uh, but many of these students didn't learn much when they were in school about their own community, or if they did about the Chicano community or the, or the uh, Cuban community or Colombian, they didn't learn about the others. And so uh, I think that this is a, it's a great time to produce literature and nonfiction uh, and films and plays and, uh, and TV shows that focus on the, uh, the intricacies and the, and the complexity of the development of Latino community. And, uh, and it's great to see all the filmmakers and writers that are developing. You know what I loved about uh, Harvest is how you start with colonialism and then how it read the, the, the effects of colonialism to today. And I, I, that's what really, in, um, really caught my imagination of the Harvest. And you do it in such a compact, summarized way, starting from Columbus to today. I thought that that was amazing. And I, what I remember um, um, reading from one of your paragraphs was also saying how colonialism doesn't always come with an army. It comes with kind people who are nice to you, teachers that are nice to you and teach you about George Washington and smile and say, read this book. And it's, you know, J.D. Salinger's Catch in the Rye. They don't give you P.D. Thomas. They don't give you your own culture. They're very nicely colonializing you. And you think that they're, they're, they're your friends. And that's how you colonialize a community the way you colonialize a country by sending missionaries are beautiful and not an army. And I was like, damn, that's, that's on the money right there. Gentlemen, I'm afraid that our time is up. Uh, what an honor it was to spend this hour with you too. I'll pass it along back to James. Hey, thank you so much. Um, you know, for those of you who've been with us from the beginning here, you know that there were some technical glitches thanks to Eventbrite. Um, it's a funny thing. Whenever there are glitches with something like this, it's always on the technical side and not on the side of the, the minds and the souls of the people who are um, taking part in it. And what a conversation we just all got to uh, learn from and enjoy this evening. Um, we're book people, and this is what all of this tech is supposed to lead to, is what to enjoy. Um, Rosie Cordero, Juan Gonzalez, Ernesto Quinones, uh, I can't thank you enough. This has been Truly wonderful. Um, Bodega Dreams. Bodega Dreams. I, I, I would be incredibly remiss if I didn't point out and remind people. Oh, we got that our Toby. I got the Our book selling partner for this uh, was the Lit Bar from the Bronx. Uh, and you can purchase um, Juan's books and Ernesto's books and, you know, any books you want. We want you to buy lots and lots of books uh, by just going to thelitbar.com. They've been a wonderful partner in this. Um, and before everyone goes, because you're joining us here this evening, um, I get to share what our next selection in the How Have I Not Read This Book Club is going to be. And it will be James Baldwin's No Name in the Street. Uh, we're going to do the virtual event on November 12th. And we'll be joined by Eddie S. Cloud Jr., Hilton Owls, and Imani Perry. Uh, that'll be moderated by Julian Lucas. Um, and our book selling partner for that will be Uncle Bobby's Coffee and Books from Philadelphia. 